Good morning, friends. One of the things we noticed from the parable of the tenants is that when Jesus asked the religious leaders of Israel what the owner of the vineyard should do to the tenants that behaved so wickedly against him, those men did not hesitate in their answer. He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. That's what they say. And this shows that they do understand what justice requires in that situation. Again, by their word choice, we can see that they they were respond vehemently to Jesus' question, as if they themselves are indignant to think about the evil actions of the tenants in the story. They call those tenants wretches and readily admit that they deserve miserable deaths. And the religious leaders fully understand, at least in terms of this specific story, that the tenants have proven themselves unworthy of the vineyard itself. And this, of course, is all very ironic because Jesus tells this parable in the first place to draw these men to this conclusion such that he can then reveal that they are themselves those wicked tenants. That in real life, both in the present day of that day and throughout their history, the people of Israel had done the exact same thing to the very God who gave them the promise of that kingdom. They rejected and killed the servants, the prophets, whom he had sent to them to call them back to himself, and they were about to murder God's own son, even as the tenants murdered the son of their master. And so the religious leaders understood justice, and they even knew how to apply it properly, just not when it came to themselves. And you know what? We have another very significant example of this happening uh, elsewhere in the scriptures as well. Because you may remember the sin of King David, his sin against Bathsheba, against Uriah, against his own people, and most of all, of course, his sin against God. Because at a certain point in David's life, he wasn't where he should have been. He should have been in the springtime with his armies leading them from the front, as was the responsibility of kings in that day. But instead, he was home in Jerusalem, looking out over the city from the roof of his palace. And as he does that, he sees this beautiful woman bathing on the roof of her own house, because the roof, the house roofs were flat in that day and often used for such things. And seeing her beauty, David calls for her to come into his own bedchamber, then And when it becomes apparent that Bathsheba is pregnant by David, he tries to cover it all up by having her husband, Uriah, who was serving in David's army. Okay, so so just look at the contrast there. Uriah is serving in David's army where David should have been. So David is negligent there as well. But now David has slept with Uriah's wife. And now it's a long and involved story as far as, far as what he does with Uriah, but uh, long story short, uh, David has it so that Uriah goes into battle at the head and in the thickest of, of fighting, and then, then David has it so that his own forces withdraw, leaving Uriah in the thick of the fighting by himself, which of course means he is cut down by the enemy. So essentially, David gives orders that Bathsheba's husband be murdered so that he could then take Bathsheba officially as his own wife and try to cover up this fact that he's going to have this child through Bathsheba. But, you know, hopefully nobody looks too closely at the, at the timeline. So this is an incredible evil that David has done. And God is going to send David, one of his servants, to convict David of this great sin. So the prophet Nathan comes to David. And much like Jesus with the leaders of Israel all those hundreds of years later, Nathan tells David a story. In this story, there's a rich man and a poor man. The rich man had everything, but the poor man had only one little lamb that he loved dearly. And what happens in the story is that the rich man is put in a position where he has to be hospitable to a traveler and provide him with a meal and everything. But instead of providing for this this traveler's meal from his own herds and flocks, he instead steals the one lamb that the poor man actually has. And he takes that lamb and he uses it. He slaughters it and uses it to feed his own uh, guest. And hearing this story from Nathan, David basically flies into a rage at the indecency, the injustice of what the rich man does in the story. He had hundreds of lambs he could have provided from his own flock, but instead he stole the one lamb, the only lamb that the poor man had, a lamb the poor man loved dearly and treated like family. And so David declares, hearing this story, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. At which point Nathan says to David, you are that man.
He was the rich man. Uriah was the poor man. David had the whole kingdom. He had everything. Uriah had only his wife, Bathsheba, whom he loved and who the, the rest of the story indicates she loved him. And yet David, who again already had everything, he took the only things that Uriah had away from him. He took his wife and then he took his life. And yet as Nathan told the story and as David's anger kindled against the rich man from the story, we see another example of a man who has perpetrated great evil, David himself, having a correct sense of justice. He just wasn't applying that justice to himself. He should have felt his own conviction rising up inside of himself as soon as Nathan laid out the scenario of the story. He should have put the pieces together that that was him immediately. But instead, his anger burned against the rich man from the story without any thought that the rich man was intended to represent him, just as the tenants represented the leaders of Israel in Jesus' own day. And so we are reminded that we all do have a sense of justice, each one of us. And really, when it comes down to it, we love justice. We want to see justice accomplished and applied when it's against other people. We rarely are eager to have that same justice applied to ourselves, right? We find ourselves in David's shoes, in the chief priest and elder's shoes, where we recognize when someone else has committed this grievous crime, but we have a blind eye to that same crime that we actually committed and how we therefore deserve to receive justice as well. But even as we admit this truth, that we all have this tendency, there's yet another choice before us. Because we have stories told to the religious leaders of Jesus' day by Jesus. We have the story told to David by Nathan, uh, both of which were intended, both those stories were intended to bring conviction upon the people listening to the stories. Because, of course, both those groups committed great evil. But there's one massive difference between David and and then the chief priests and elders and all the rest. Because when the religious leaders of Jesus' day realized that Jesus was talking about them, that only made them want to kill Jesus even more. Okay, They they saw the connection that Jesus was making between them and the tenants. But instead of submitting to that and repenting, they just locked up even tighter. They were going to defend themselves all the more. And so they wanted to kill Jesus just that much more vehemently. But if we go back to the story of Nathan confronting David, David did great evil. But when he's confronted with that evil, how does he respond? Well, Nathan says, you are the man, the rich man who who you say deserves to die. And Nathan lays out all the consequences that God is going to bring upon David and his household and the kingdom because of his sin. And after Nathan has laid all that out, David simply responds, I have sinned against the Lord. And I suppose you might say that that's a weak response, but really, what other response are you going to give? Anything else beyond that is just not what you should say. What you should say, should you say, I'm sorry? You know, as as if just saying I'm sorry is gonna gonna fix something. There are times when when you're faced with your incredible guilt that if you just immediately say I'm sorry, that's just empty, and it's almost the last thing you ought to say. Rather, just I have sinned against the Lord, admitting our guilt. It should be a time, especially with this kind of really big long-term sin, where the guilty party just comes face to face with their guilt, processing what they've done, coming to a full understanding of the severity of what they've done. Because only then can the repentance that comes later, can it be a true repentance. And praise the Lord, that's what David does. He is cut to the heart to realize his own evil, And therefore, he admits his guilt before the Lord. And in Psalm 51, where David later expresses his desire for forgiveness and restoration, he writes first, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. 
And what a difference, what a contrast that is between those two reactions. Jesus, the actual son of God, comes to the religious leaders of Israel in the first century. He brings that story of the tenants to reveal the religious leaders' own sin and wickedness. And when they realize the connection, those men just want to double down on their wickedness. They want to kill, you know, Jesus, the son of God, even more. But going back to David, a mere servant, not the son of God, but a mere servant of God, the prophet Nathan comes to David revealing his wickedness. And yet by the grace of God, he is willing to admit that guilt, not double down on it, not say, I am the king. How dare you come at me with this accusation? No, he admits the truth of the conviction and he comes to true repentance through that admission. And that's how it ought to be for us because we have all committed sin against the Lord and each other as well. May we be willing, therefore, to see how justice applies to us as well as just seeking justice against others. May we be humble enough to submit to the conviction of our own wrongdoing. And then in realizing that wrongdoing, let us respond like David rather than the religious leaders. Instead of trying to cover up what we've done or, or, or deny what we've done, let us acknowledge it before the Lord and then seek his forgiveness. Seek his salvation, which we will receive. For all who call in the name of the Lord will be saved. May that be our response in humility to care about justice, not just for those people over there, but for ourselves as well, recognizing what we deserve ourselves, which drives us all the more eagerly and even desperately to cling to the salvation that comes by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ, in whom there is forgiveness for all our sins. I pray you have a good and godly day, and Lord willing, I will see you soon.